Good evening. We will be starting shortly. Just give a, a minute or two for more attendees to join us. In the meantime, I can introduce you to my co-speakers, uh, Dr. Christoph Schlimp with the spectacles. He's the man from Austria, the, um, the trauma uh, expert. And below him is uh, Dr. Mark Etzel from St. George's in London. And uh, I would like to thank the Intensive Care Society and the Faculty of Intensive Care for giving us this opportunity to talk to you about uh, iatrogenic air embolism. I will kick off with a short introduction and then I will pass on to Dr. Schlimp, who will bat further and he, when he's finished, he will pass on to Dr. Etzel, who will uh, do a header or possibly a higher hand uh, and continue the conversation. So uh, we are ready to go. Oh, and please remember the questions and answers at the bottom. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you tonight about hydrogenic air or gas embolism. Although this can happen in trauma medicine, and we also see it in diving medicine, when we see it as a iatrogenic complication, we are a lot more concerned because not only is there the patient to be concerned about and the family that are often very angry, but we also have the second victim and in some instances, a third victim. And it is our duty to look after all the victims. We have a fairly short agenda tonight. I will be discussing the following with you and hopefully we already agree that it is an important issue. We will talk briefly about incidents and guidelines and then Dr. Christoph Schlimp will talk about etiology and mechanism of tissue damage. He will be followed by Dr. Mark Etzel who will discuss acute management and hyperbaric treatment and hopefully we will have enough time for discussion and further questions. I have no conflict of interest. I am the medical director of the London Hyperbaric Unit in Whips Cross Hospital in London. I had to reduce my PAs to be able to have adequate time for the job. I am also clinical lead for intensive care in James Paget Hospital and the lead for the hyperbaric unit. We are able to treat air embolism cases as it is commissioned by NHS England and there are no additional fees. I have to add that I have no shares in the company and I do not get any commission. My first experience of air embolism as a junior anaesthetist was quite traumatic. I took a patient to intensive care after an evacuation of products of conception in a septic abortion case. She also had a laparotomy. She arrived in intensive care with a blood pressure of 80 and was quite pale. The hemoglobin was 80 as well. The intensivist was not happy and took a bottle of O negative blood from the fridge. He connected an air insufflator and pumped air into the bottle. As was the practice in those days in some hospitals in severely shocked patient. After the first bottle, the blood pressure was much better and I left. I barely reached the door when I heard a commotion behind me. I turned around and the patient had a cardiac arrest when the nurse took her eye off the bottle and pumped in a lot of air. The patient was unresuscitatable 
and we heard later that the nurse took her own life. Captain George Hart was a thoracic surgeon and chief of surgery in the Naval Center in Texas. He was concerned about the high number of iatrogenic air embolism referred to them. His colleagues were not convinced that his estimate of up to 20,000 cases per year was realistic. He could not convince them because he had no data. And this is our current problem with very little data to prove the magnitude of the problem. Not much data has been published since Hart's data in the 1970s. In the UK, I found with some difficulty ICNARC and NPSA data, but the other organizations could not help. Internationally, in hyperbaric literature, the following were published, but keeping in mind this is only cases that was referred and treated in hyperbaric units. In the last column, you see the population in millions, and next to that, the author or the main author of the publication. This bar graph gives a visual indication of population of the draining areas in orange and the number of hyperbaric cases in blue, keeping in mind that this is just hyperbaric referrals. It is difficult to understand the difference in statistics between the UK and other first world countries. Nobody can really explain it. Is it a lack of belief in hyperbaric therapy? Is it missed diagnosis? Could it be that tertiary care colleagues do not trust their patients to go to a district general hospital? Or is it insufficient training? Studying a disease like this can be very difficult. In the past, animal models have served as well. And in the early days, horses were used. Subsequently, smaller animals like dogs, cats, monkeys, and rabbits were used. Our colleagues in Amsterdam and Den Helder in the Netherlands are using a pig model. Des Gorman in Auckland and his co-workers have used this rabbit model, injecting a small amount of air in the carotid artery, has demonstrated very well how gas bubbles cause ischemia in the brain. They have also ablated the neutrophils in the rabbit and found that Without neutrophils, the gas bubbles seem to be doing much less harm. And that probably explains why hyperbaric treatment, in addition to eliminating the gas bubbles, also decrease white cell clumping and improve the microcirculation. Furthermore, laboratory models can be studied, and Christoph will expand on that. Case reports are very useful as well. They are a bit like the closed claim studies in America. Once you have done the duty of candor, you can then ask consent for publication, and this graph indicate the increase over the years of number of publications, mostly case reports. 
and then lastly a registry. This is already in place for hyperbaric cases, but what we need is a national registry indicating all cases, alive or dead. Prevention is always better than cure, and up-to-date guidelines is a good first step. The AAGBI Vascular Access Guideline has been published in 2016 and is probably due for a review. The 2019 Intensive Care Society Guideline is published on their website. It has an easy to read flow diagram with a step-by-step -step guidance, including a list of all the hyperbaric units in England and in Scotland. In Northern Ireland is a unit that is available on a ad hoc basis. And on that note, I will hand over to Dr. Schlimp. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. It does, however, appear that I have a specific interest in crew and crisis resource management and patient safety. So it always strikes me when I read a case report like this one, case reports you almost find on a weekly or sometimes daily basis published um, in the Medline, just like this one a few days ago where three patients developed neurological disturbances soon after central venous catheter manipulation. So I was asked to talk to you about the etiology and mechanism of damage of iatrogenic gas embolism. And we need to divide this into the arterial gas embolism um, with probably the most complicated or, or most severe form, the cerebral arterial gas embolism. Um, and we also need to talk about the origin of this, that would be paradoxical gas embolism, where the source is initially venous. And I wanna develop on the venous gas embolism, get some words on pulmonary embolism, but wanna lead you to, to very interesting topic that would be the retrograde cerebral venous gas embolism. So let's move to arterial gas embolism. Where does the gas go to? So this would be directly into the arteries of the systemic circulation, or it comes indirectly via the pulmonary veins. How does it usually happen? Well, arterial vascular access is a very good access for air getting into the arterial system. We do know that, especially in cardiac, um, thoracic or vascular surgery, um, we often do have a direct fistula into the arterial system. We do know that extracorporeal bypass is prone to, to leave um, arterial embolism. We do know that angio, cardio or radiology procedures um, may be prone to this. Um, yeah, there have been reports of arterial gas embolism directly coming from laparoscopic surgery. Well, especially in the um, hyperbaric and, and diving medicine, we do know that pulmonary barotrauma um, could cause arterial gas embolism. And of course, paradoxical embolism initially coming from the venous system. What's the typical di distribution? Well, if you start from the aorta, air embolism can principally move into any systemic artery possible. What's the pathophysiology? Well, you will find a reduction in the perfusion distal to the obstruction and probably an inflammatory response to, response to the bubble. What's the clinical implication? Well, it's less common compared to the venous one, but it usually comes with a high morbidity or even mortality, especially when affecting the coronary arteries or nutritive arteries of the brain. What is the reported 
path the mechanism behind cerebral arterial gas embolism. So it's probably the obstruction causing the metabolic processes of the neurons to fail. Um, so sodium and water enter the neuron and cytotoxic edema develops. The surface of the bubble generates a foreign body response through cellular and humoral immune mechanisms. And the bubble also mechanically irritates the arterial endothelium. So both processes result in vasogenic edema and greater impairment of perfusion. And apparently the neuronal injury extends beyond the area of obstruction. We also need to be aware that there is a, um, a thing like retrograde arterial gas embolism. And this has been reported from, from flushing arterial lines. So you'll find on this slide a couple of um, literature you might want to look um, at it. And it even has been reported that massive cerebral arterial embolism um, was following arterial catheteration. Some words about paradoxical arterial gas embolism. Well, this is when gas initially um, enters the systemic venous circulation, um, but is transferred and moves to the systemic arterial system. So this could happen either via a right to left jump in the heart, for example, a patent foramen ovale or septum defects. This could be arterial venous malformation in the lungs or it could simply be the overwhelming of the pulmonary capillary filter. Let's talk about venous gas embolism. So how does gas enter the systemic um, venous circulation? Um, for this, you need a pressure gradient into an open venous vessel. Um, and you either need a positive outside or you need a negative inside um, with the reference, um, let's say, the, the, the atmospheric pressure. Here you will find a list with typical reported causes of venous gas yeah. embolism, probably with central line insertion manipulation or removal, the most prominent one I've also experienced in my literature research. So what is the distribution following um, gas coming into the venous circulation? So the, the, the typical thought of um, distribution is pulmonary. So the gas is transported um, with the venous blood to the lungs. The pathophysiology of pulmonary gas embolism is that you have the interference with the gas exchange. Um, it might lead to cardiac arrhythmias. Um, with the, um, yeah, you might have pulmonary hypertension and apparently you might have a right ventricular strain or even cardiac failure um, in, the, in the worst aspect leading to um, asystolia. From a clinical point of view, it is probably most common in reality compared to um, arterial embolism. So compared to arterial gas embolism, it's probably having less mortality and morbidity. And there is a much larger tolerance um, to, to, to large amounts of, of venous gas as compared to arterial where single bubbles can obstruct um, a vessel. Um, but yes, it's potentially life-threatening and it appears that there's still in a, inadequate awareness for this um, entity in our clinical praxis. There are two other distributions. Apparently, um, venous gas embolism can um, develop into a paradoxical arterial gas embolism with the risk of cerebral arterial gas embolism probably being the worst scenario in this. And there might be a third way um, of distribution um, that would be the retrograde cerebral venous gas embolism. I want to tell you a little bit about my personal journey into this topic. So um, I was working for a medical education center as a tutor when I started um, um, yeah, being a medical student and, 
and we were told that there's a reduced clinical awareness for venous gas embolism through central venous catheter manipulation. Um, so we developed a, a teaching tool for um, for such central venous catheter manipulation, and um, <clears throat> and we did some calculations um, and did some experimentations with real airflow rates through central venous catheters, and I realized that all literature that I could get hold of um, cited the law of hagen um on the, the flow rates of air into such a catheter. So how much air um, does usually come through a central venous catheter? Um, as I was saying, we did some calculations and we did some, some, some real experimentation in, in, a, in a simulated model and it turned out that Although, in theory, Hagen-Posoch's law was frequently cited in all publications, um, well, luckily for the patient, I would say, um, the, the real airflow rate through a um, central venous catheter, in this example, it was a 16-gauge, 16-centimeter um, 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 catheter. Um, and there's where the real airflow rates um, into a simulated blood circulation. Because in reality, you also need to account for order canal pressure loss at the catheter tip. You have a capillary effect in a small circular um, central venous catheter. We did publish a couple of things, um, and and for example, we did um, publish those calculations um, following a, a a case we had in in the Innsbruck hospital um, after a um, from a patient um, after being buried in an avalanche. In the end, it turned out that that the source for for the for the air most likely was due to to central venous catheterization. Um, we also had a, a case um, in Innsbruck where due to a pressure infusion of contrast media, air entrained via stopcock um, improperly fixed to the venous cannula, um, or it could also even have been where the injection valve of the cannula by Venturi forces. So um, this is another example where too much pressure might cause um, Venus Air and published this, um, yeah, also in, in the British Medical Journal case reports. Um, and my journey uh, was going on, and, and because during those experimentation simulated blood flow, we suddenly realized that there is a potential for the retrograde venous rise, um, even. Um, against the blood flow. And then we started to do a literature research on cerebral venous gas embolism. And um, because we wanted to know um, which ways are documented um, in, in literature. Um, is it just the, the, the pulmonary way? Is it the, the paradoxical way? Or is there any documentation of the retrograde way? we saw in our experimentations. Looking at literature was interesting because although we suspected many cerebral venous gas embolism in, in the pictures, uh, the explanation was always paradoxical. And even when there were no signs of, uh, of, of a PFO, um, it was called paradoxical. Um, or they also said, well, we don't know, but we expect it's paradoxical. So all those reports with um, obvious venous gas embolism um, in the cerebrum um, were um, suspected to be paradoxical. Um, until I found the case report of Franz Plona from South Tyrol, um, published in The Lancet 1991. Um, and I met him even a few years later and he provided me with those pictures and you clearly see lots of air in the sinus um, and also distributed um, over both hemispheres. And he was the first one to actually um, suspect that there is a retrograde way. 
Um, so I involved a specialized fluid physicist and we did lots of calculation. I mean, the trivia is that that apparently the density of air is so much lower than the density of blood. Um, but we also calculated um, bubble size complexity using Tate's law, border canal, pressure loss, capillary forces, visco um, viscosity. And during the time, I also had a, a um, personal communication that visible gas bubbles um, were observed by vascular surgeons um, traveling upwards in the internal jugular veins. So we went back to the laboratory, um, again, did an extensive literature research involved radiology, um, and we were realizing that there was an forensic interest. Um, and then we published this paper. Um, we're even popping up in the National Criminal Justice Reference Service of the United States. And with this model, um, we simulated the standard clinical central venous catheter in, inserted into um, a simulated superior vena cava, and we even adjusted the, the flow on this. Um, and we could see that in an upright um, superior vena cava, the air rises retrogradely to the blood circulation. Um, the smaller the diameter of the, the vena cava, um, air would not rise anymore. Um, but like with the large cava, it would rise retrogradely, um, even at angles greater than 10 degrees. What you see here is the condensed diagram of many pages of an old fashioned handwritten manuscript from our fluid physicist. So according to Tate's law, air flux through a 16 gauge lumen results in air bubbles of approximately three millimeters in diameter. If you happen to open a large bore catheter, not only the amount, but also the air bubble diameter becomes even bigger. So this busy slide shows on the left side flow velocity values of either the superior vena cava blood flow downstream or the air bubbles upstream. The blood flow velocity depends on cardiac output and the diameter of the vena cava. And the air bubble rise velocity depends on their diameter. So if you overlap those calculated values, you can nicely see in this diagram that even for normal conditions, let alone for a circulatory compromised patient, the air bubbles coming from a central venous catheter may principally rise against the blood flow in an head up elevated patient. On the other hand, it also shows why small air bubbles may be generating from osseous structures as in open neuro or spine surgery might travel with the blood flow. Literature. Um research we have done um, was, was based on, on the fact that cases had to meet the conditions of the history of a central venous catheterization, um, consecutive neurological symptoms, a CT diagnosed cerebral air and will listen, no diagnosed PFO and exclusion of neurosurgical procedures. And in the end, we found six case reports meeting all those criteria um, and of the radiologist and the radiologist um, could clearly tell us that the areas of air appeared too large in diameter to be situated in a cerebral arterial system at this um, anatomical um, position. So what's the, the, the most likely pathology of retrograde cerebral venous gas embolism? So we hypothesize that with retrograde cerebral venous gas embolism, there's no immediate arterial obstruction causing um, ischemia, um, but the inflammatory response between gas bubbles and the endothelium may lead to the activation of neutrophils with beta-2 integrin adhesion to endothelial cells, resulting in stasis and venous infarction. Um, this was the, the picture of Franz Plona of um, his patient um, several days later. And you actually see um, 
massive cerebral edema um, that has developed. Well, um, in 2012, I, I kind of met um, and started writing with Peter and, and we started to discuss and we did publish um, a couple of um, um, letters and, and editorials um, because we have the interest of raising more awareness on, on the chances for our patients when um, when the physicians recognize the concept of retrograde cerebral venous gas embolism um, much earlier. Um, and I'm going to close this talk with the case reports I started with. What you see here is um, two patients, both patients most likely suspected with um, cerebral venous um, gas embolism. Um, so the angiogram shows no arterial obstruction. Um, this um, are those are CT scans of um, a couple of days later, where in this patient um, you definitely see um, signs of ischemia and infarction. While this patient recovered, um, and this patient was the one um, that was brought to hyperbaric um, oxygenation therapy quite early, um, and so I want to hand over. To the next talk where this probably might be an issue. Thank you very much for your interest. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and thank you very much to the Intensive Care Society for inviting me to talk with you this evening about the management of gas embolism. I work in anaesthesia and critical care and like most anaesthetists I've always been fascinated by physiology and it was that that led me into hyperbaric medicine, first as a junior doctor, and now um, I'm lucky enough to have an honorary contract working at London Hyperbaric Medicine in Whips Cross. Over the next 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to run through with you some of the clinical aspects of patient care, focusing first on the early management that's done in the referring hospital, before moving on to talk a bit more about what we do in the hyperbaric chamber and discuss some of the unique challenges of working in this environment. I'd like to start by signposting you to this new um, Intensive Care Society guideline on the management of gas embolism. And that's partly what this webinar is all about, to raise awareness of this guideline. Um, most of what I'm going to talk about in the coming slides will be covered within this document. And this picture here shows the um, flowchart of the early management, which I'm going to go through in a second. So my one take home message from, from this slide is uh, after the webinar, if you um, go onto Google and search Intensive Care Society Gas Embolism, it'll pop straight up on your browser and you can, um, and you can download it. Um, also, it's got a, a subsection in it specifically looking at the risk around CVC insertion and removal, uh, which is another high risk uh, procedure, which is often where air embolism is often not recognized. Um, so I would, um, uh, yeah, advise you to download that and, um, and take a look at it after the webinar. The first step in the immediate management is to stop further entrainment of air. This may be obvious in certain situations such as neurosurgery in the sitting position, but more often than not, it's not immediately recognised. So it's important to have a high index of suspicion if there's any unexpected instability in the patient or neurological change in neurological function during, during high-risk procedures such as neurosurgery, uh, vascular catheter procedures, uh, laparoscopic surgery, etc. The patient should be live flat um, to prevent um, the air traveling to the brain and placed on 100% oxygen. The mainstay of the rest of the treatment revolves around um, standard supportive management in line with the ABCs. If the patient is stable enough, they should be moved into the left lateral position to prevent uh, or reduce the risk of air transiting from the venous circulation in, into the arterial through the heart. Early imaging is essential to get an idea of whether there is cerebral gas and look for, uh, look for evidence of tissue ischemia in, in other areas, particularly if it's inadvertent injection of gas into an arterial line. A stable bubble in solution has two principal forces acting against one another to maintain its stability. First, the gas pressure within the bubble seeking to force it outwards 
and secondly the surface tension um, along the bubble wall seeking to cause the bubble to collapse. Of course as bubbles transit along the arterial system they tend to coalesce forming columns of air which obstruct flow. The surface tension forces act in direct opposition to arterial blood flow, highlighting the importance of a high perfusion pressure. 100% oxygen helps reduce the bubble size through, an, through increasing the um, diffusion gradient of nitrogen from the bubble back into the blood. So it's these two key um, aspects of care that should be initiated as soon as, as soon as the diagnosis is made. So once the patient is stabilised and whilst the diagnosis is being made, it's good to speak to your local hyperbaric unit as early as possible. Even if you don't feel the patient would be acceptable for transfer to for hyperbaric treatment, discussing it with someone who deals with these conditions all the time is likely to help you with the ongoing management and we would certainly encourage that. If not all units have a level one capability to treat intensive care patients, but they may be able to discuss the case with other units and help with the transfer process and help you along the way. Um, because there, there, is, there are risks associated with transferring patients from hospital to hospital, it's important that we have a consultant to consultant discussion early to make sure that the risk is acceptable to all concerned. And what do we want to know? Well, of course, apart from the history of what's gone on, the timings around when the air emboli occurred, we also want to know the clinical condition of the patient, what sorts of um, uh, infusions they're on, the level of stability, what tubes and lines are present, especially things that involving air cavities such as chest drains, intraatic balloon pump obviously wouldn't be able to work within a hyperbaric environment. And then there's things like pa the presence of pacemakers, internal or external, and whether the patient is dependent on those things or not. We would encourage you to book transport as early as possible because this can be a big uh, reason for delay in getting people to the chamber. A hyperbaric chamber should be very much considered as a remote site. Although most units are co-located within hospitals, um, they're still a very isolated and contained environment. And although that you can see the patient by looking directly through the hatch, you're still a long, long way away from them in terms of the pressure differences and the time it can take to bring the patient back to the surface. It's also a very challenging place to work. As you can see, they're often very confined with limited space for all the equipment and the patient and staff. It can be a noisy environment due to the constant movement of um, air within the chamber. Um, there are large swings in temperature, making the environmental conditions more challenging to work in. And on top of that, the pressure not only on the equipment, but on the staff themselves. There are specific hazards associated with hyperbaric oxygen, which I'll go into later. But early treatment is life saving and you can see quite miraculous um, uh, recovery from severe neurological injury in both decompression illness and arterial gas embolism. The one thing we are all susceptible to is, of course, the laws of physics. And the principal law we're talking about when it comes to hyperbaric oxygen is, of course, Boyle's law and the inverse relationship between pressure and volume and the impact that has on all airfield spaces within the body and the devices that are connected to the patient for their life saving treatment. Not only that is the impact of pressure on temperature with large swings of, of um, environmental temperature occurring during pressurisation that can also have an impact on the patient and staff. Prior to treatment, a number of steps need to take place on the intensive care unit, and it is helpful if some or all of these can be done in the referring hospital prior to the ambulance transfer. Consent is done by the hyperbaric team, but it's useful if the form can be countersigned by the referring consultant. Whether or not the patient has myringotomy before the treatment will depend on the availability of ENT services. Myringotomies reduce the risk of ear barotrauma during the treatment, but are by no means um, essential um, as this is a time, uh, time urgent condition. If these were not available, we would just go ahead and treat the patient and then arrange for a, a post-treatment review by ENT. 
all lines should be simplified and devices secured um, because of the confined nature of the of the chamber. Importantly, no oil-based creams or dressings should be on the patient when they go in. This is because of the risk of fire in the oxygen enriched environment. And similarly, no um, uh, clothing or bed clothes with which could produce static can be can go in. So only cotton clothing can be worn. The cuff on the ET tube needs to have the air replaced with water. This is to prevent cuff leaks during compression and tracheal barotrauma during decompression. Similarly, all drains and bags need to be emptied of air uh, to reduce the risk of, of um, them uh, exploding during decompression. Because of the remote location, it's useful to, for us to have spare drugs of all the essential medications um, before we go down and uh, the treatment itself lasts 4 hours 45 minutes so we often need um, multiple spare syringes of vasopressors and sedation. If chest drains are in place we normally place a Heimlich one-way valve in the circuit just to reduce the risk of air entrainment from the water bottle in the, in the event of expansion of air during decompression. Any equipment going into the chamber needs to be assessed for its compatibility with hyperbaric oxygen. Most importantly, this involves assessing it in terms of the risk of spark and fire and explosion, um, because that's obviously the biggest risk. But also we need to understand the effect of the increased pressure on the device function, uh, particularly looking at ventilators and the impact of the increased gas density on the ventilator, but also pressure transducers, pacemakers, whether they've been pressure tested to certain levels. Most internal pacemakers are considered safe up to three atmospheres of pressure, but external pacemakers, different hospitals have different ones, and so it uh, can be difficult to understand exactly which ones are safe to go in or not. There is one uh, brand of pacemaker that is hyperbaric compatible, and we can convert the patient over to that device if we need to in the chamber. Obviously, defibrillation comes with its own risks, and you wouldn't do it unless you absolutely have to. Um, on, if at all possible, you would try to get the patient up to atmospheric pressure, bring them to the surface and resuscitate them at the surface if possible. Um, but if it must be done, then it can it has been shown to be safely delivered, but it needs to be done. The actual defibrillator sits outside of the chamber and the, um, and the wires go in through conduits in the chamber wall. So it requires quite a lot of communication between the team inside resuscitating and the team outside directing care to, to be done safely. In the event of external pacing wire failure, you can use um, external pacing pads to overcome that. Syringe drivers you have pressure sensors to deliver the driving pressure on the, on the tip of the syringe, and so they can be very affected by uh, changes in atmospheric pressure. Um, we use these pilot hyperbaric um, safe syringes, um, and they, they they reliably deliver the uh, deliver the drug over the over the um, range of pressures used. So the ideal hyperbaric ventilator would be one that was certified as hyperbaric safe in terms of its fire risk, but also able to deliver all um, standard ICU modalities, pressure control, um, BiPAP, all those other all those um, modalities. Um, within the chamber itself and not be too big because this because it's so um, small and be cheap. Unfortunately nothing's ideal so the Mackay Servo I hyperbaric delivers all of those all of those things but it's certainly not cheap. It's important irrespective of what ventilator you use um, you must monitor the ventilation throughout the treatment through uh, end tidal CO2, expiratory tidal volumes and ar regular arterial blood gases. Hyperbaric oxygen has two main effects on the ventilatory system. Obviously, the gas density is multiplied by 2.8, and that increases the work of breathing. So one needs to adjust pressure support and trigger levels in order to overcome those changes. The cartoon in the middle of this diagram just indicates that um, the turbulent flow due to the gas density occurs much lower down the airways than in normal, normal back pressure. So not just the upper airway and trachea, you'll have turbulent flow, but also in the, in the um, lower bronchioles as well. 
because the work of breathing goes up, if you're a spontaneously breathing patient, this can cause quite a few problems. So personally, I think it's easier and safer just to paralyze the patient and take over ventilation to, so you can control for the increased gas density uh, without the patient's respiratory effort uh, being involved. The hyperoxygenation, the hyperbaric oxygen part of it also leads to atelectasis um, and you can and that can lead to, to problems with oxygenation after the treatment. And so you often need to find it, need extra PEEP and recruitment after the procedure. Um, because we often treat these patients on more than one occasion, uh, this ten it tends to be a cyclical thing of hyperbaric treatment, improvement in oxygenation, improvement in, in clinical condition, and then a slight deterioration as the effects of the oxygen on the atelectasis occur. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy treats arterial gas embolism and decompression illness through a number of complementary mechanisms. First, there's the pressure and the effect of Boyle's law on the bubble volume. As the pressure increases, the volume in the bubble decreases. With the doubling of the pressure, you get a halving of the volume. With the biggest change occurring over the first change in, from one atmosphere to two atmospheres. We typically use 2.8 atmospheres as the optimal depth as a trade-off between the impact on the size of the bubble versus the deleterious effects of high pressure oxygen in terms of oxygen toxicity and the impact on the chamber attendance. The hyperoxia has a number of other effects. The massive partial pressure of oxygen within the blood vastly increases the oxygen diffusion distance, allowing oxygen to get to previously un unreached um, ischemic tissues. The inert gas within the bubble is, uh, is removed more quickly due to denitrogenation of the blood through breathing 100% oxygen. This leads to removal of the, an increased pressure gradient between the nitrogen in the, in the uh, bubble versus the nitrogen in the blood, uh, increasing the shrinking of the bubble. And hyperbaric oxygen also has some anti-inflammatory effects, which cause a reduction in the inflammatory response and also a reduction in ischemia reperfusion injury. And lastly, um, you get an edema reduction, so peripheral edema, and that's due to the osmotic effect of the high oxygen within the blood. And oxygen at that level also causes vasoconstriction. So you tend to see a reduction in, in vasoconstrictor requirements over the duration of the treatment. So the treatments we used are based on, on empirical military diving tables. This is called the US Navy ta Treatment Table 6, and it's our standard protocol for decompression illness. There is a Royal Navy Treatment Table as well, but, um, but uh, as um, hyperbaric oxygen is, is much bigger in the States, it the American tables have become the standards across the world. It's four hours, 45 minutes in length at its basic level. And you can see, you pressurize the patient, that typically the, the, um, the diagrams always go down indicating depth. And this being America is in, is in feet of seawater rather than meters. But you um, compress the patient to 18 meters and then they go on oxygen for 20 minutes before having an air break. The air breaks are there to reduce the risk of oxygen toxicity and oxygen toxicity fits. After three cycles of hyperbaric oxygen, what we would normally do is assess the patient towards the end of the first stage to, to look for clinical improvement. If the patient is awake, obviously we can assess their neurological function and make a decision as to whether we need to extend the treatment at 18 meters and put in more 20 minute um, treatments or um, come up to nine meters for the second stage of the, of the treatment table. In intubated patients, obviously it's impossible to assess um, their, fun their neurological function when intubated. So what we tend to do is just run a standard treatment table and then bring them back to the intensive care unit and try to wean sedation and assess them then. Obviously, decompression is another time uh, where there's real risks. In, the, in reverse to pressurization, when we depressurize the patient, any volume, any air, air spaces within the, within the body will increase in size. And the biggest risk is, of course, pneumothorax that could become a tension pneumothorax. So it's important to regularly listen to the chest, albeit, as, I, as I've said, it can be very difficult to diagnose uh, changes with, with the noise within the chamber. 
On top of that, the attendants, when we're decompressing at the end of the treatment, the attendants will be on oxygen because they too have been effectively diving for four hours. So they need to go through their own decompression profile. And that means they'll be on oxygen to prevent decompression illness. And so they're breathing on oxygen bibs and it can be even harder to hear what's going on. You need to keep a close eye on the pressure bag, the transducer bag, because obviously that will increase in size and that could pop. So you need to decompress that regularly. Check the, the IV lines because any air within the drip set could expand and that could lead to problems with um, getting an air embolus itself. And um, most importantly, regularly looking uh, for tension pneumothorax. So as I've said, it can be very difficult to diagnose in the intubated and ventilated patient until you've got quite advanced hemodynamic signs. Uh, you may get you may see tracheal deviation, but you're more likely to see cardiovascular changes, tachycardia and hypotension. In the awake patients, patients typically complain of pain in the chest and increase of work of breathing. If you suspect a pneumothorax, the first thing to do is stop the decompression and recompress slightly until symptoms improve or cardiovascular changes normalize. Um, Diagnosing it, as I said, is difficult. This is a picture of the chamber I worked in in Australia. We had an x-ray machine on the roof of the chamber, which could you could pay, put the patient under there and do a check, chest x-ray. But in any UK centres I've seen, they don't have this. So we, we tend to, to use new, um, clinical diagnosis and sometimes ultrasound. Um, once you've recompressed the patient and the signs have improved, you can then either do a needle decompression or insert a chest drain and then safely um, complete the decompression. So in summary, the early management of suspected embolism is crucial. Lying the patient flat, 100% oxygen, stabilise with resuscitate and resuscitate, and an early discussion with the local chamber. Timely recompression improves chances of a good outcome. And proactive management is key to reducing wasted time, specifically around CT scanning, communication, ambulance transfer. The hyperbaric chamber is an isolated and contained environment and teamwork is essential for safe recompression. But with good teamwork, we can get good outcomes from this potentially life-threatening condition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Christoph. Um, we've had a few questions on the Q&A. Please uh, type your questions in there. We will reply to them as they come in. Um, and to start off with, um, I can just say that I've received um, two questions or two statements on my, on my phone while people were, were trying to log in. One was rather insulting, but it was ended with a, with a smiley face. And the question was, what's happened to the registry that you promised five years ago? So the answer to that is, there is... Peter, you're still on mute. You're still on mute. Uh, you're, yeah, that's it, that's better. The answer to that is the registry for hyperbaric units is now in place. It's an international registry where we will collect these cases and, and the outcomes. But more importantly is a national registry of all cases. And that is something that ideally should be organized by one of the academic units. So that's an, an open question and I'm not too offended by the uh, insult. Another question that came on my phone was, uh, and I'll direct that to Mark, is can these cases be transferred by helicopter? Uh, yes, they, yes, they can. Yeah, I mean, um, the majority of times in the UK, road, road transfer is both quicker and easier to organize. But in rural settings, you might need to um, consider a low flying um, helicopter and you'd need to, to um, work that out with the uh, retrieval team. I don't have any experience in that, but, but Christoph clearly has a lot more experience with, with air transfer than I, than I do. 
Yeah, um, but, but I have to admit, usually, um, since we are an inland country, okay, we do sometimes have divers. We do not have lots of diving injuries in, in, in Austria. So um, I've never, um, although about, hundred, uh, about a thousand missions, I've never flown a, a diving accident um, to, to the next um, hyperbaric chamber. Um, and I mean... In the UK, I suspect you're more flat than we are in, in, in Austria. In Austria, it might be an issue if you have to go over the Alps. So in this case, we probably would use um, or we would try to go a track um, um, rather um, along the streets um, to not go over the mountains, um, like from a physiological point of view. Um, yeah, but personally, no experience with um, barotrauma patients um, um, flying into an um, hyperbaric unit. Another interesting question was about reducing risk of line gas embolism, line related gas embolism. And uh, the answer there is quite comprehensive, but I would like to add that over the years we've seen a number of cases and there are quite a few publications of case reports where a, a, a line is removed according to protocol with an appropriate dressing and then a few hours later, the patient collapses uh, and it becomes evident that there is entry of uh, air through the tract. And sometimes on, on imaging, one can actually see a ghost um, channel in the tissue. So what we have recommended and what we have been implemented in our hospital is to glue the, the external orifice of the line before you put the dressing on. It is really very easy. The cost is minimal and it is uh, seemingly a logical uh, solution to that problem. Uh, in 2011, there was a series of 14 cases published by NSRL uh, of, uh, of, of line removal related. They did not indicate how long after removal, but I guess quite a few were those cases. Um, there was also an interesting question about arterial lines. Um, maybe you want to read that, Mark, and, and, and discuss your answer. Uh, sorry, what, what, what was the question? The arterial, uh, yeah, well, it was just um, basically uh, asking about how to reduce the risk of, of arterial air embolism via an arterial line, because obviously the transducer sets under pressure. And what we talked about is... Um, the use of a, sta a sort of SOP to standardize nursing monitoring of all the different uh, uh, lines of the patient. So, um, because ultimately iatrogenic embolism is, is accidental and it's not, and so the only way to stop that is to generally use a SOP or a checklist to ensure that you're not missing things. I think that's a very important point. Nobody comes to work with the idea of damaging patients. The worst mistake that we have seen on an arterial line air embolism was a, a, a situation where a nurse was distracted. She connected the transducer but did not prime it. She was called away and then someone else uh, flushed the arterial line and that was a catastrophic result. Uh, yeah. Another point to remember is that uh, if you look at a bag of 500 mils normal saline, that there is usually between uh, 20 and 50 milliliters of air. Um, but there had been a batch a few years ago where there was more than 100 mils of air in the bag. And then there's a few mils of air in the drip chamber. And those can, can be eliminated right in the beginning. If when the system is primed, the air is squeezed out of the bag, and the air in the drip chamber is removed because you don't need to see it dripping. You already eliminate one area where, where an arterial line can cause a problem. Another question, how do we raise awareness to ensure diagnosis is made in a timely manner? For both of you. I think that's what we're trying to do with this webinar really. Um, uh, but but really, you just you have to suspect it. My my own feelings that is that um, certainly working cardiac surgery is that there's a small air emboli 
um, are often considered on a ward round if there's been a neurological um, event, um, but but often you know nothing's really done about it. It's, it's sort of treated just like all the other causes of of, um, of stroke post cardiac surgery, and and by the time it's recognised the following day when they've been extubated and they've got uh, neurological symptoms, then pe people often feel it's feel like it's too late. So I think just having a really high index of suspicion is the is probably the the key thing. Just think about it. I think another another way to raise the awareness is if the examiners at at exam time and that's undergraduate as well as postgraduate uh, routinely ask a few questions, then the word will go out to the trainees. You have to know this topic, otherwise you you'll get into trouble. So it's not only teaching but also examining. I never thought of that. <laughs> Another question is, um, is there any evidence using hyperbaric oxygen for air embolism? Mark, I think that's for you. Oh, is it? Well, um, well so again, with these things, most of it is, is based on empirical treatments because it's actually been around for quite a long time. Um, there's case reports, as we've said, there's lots of, there's case series, there's no, there's never been any randomized controlled trials, um, and there's very few in hyperbaric medicine actually. Um, but it's not something that you would personally want to do. Well, I certainly personally wouldn't want to randomize someone to a no treatment arm uh, for hyperbaric oxygen. There's a clear mechanistic uh, benefit to, hyper to, to any um, pathology with bubbles in the in the body. Uh, there's a there's a clear mechanistic. Um, treatment for it, which is to pressurize them and squash the bubbles down. And there are also these other complementary effects that I talked about. So it's certainly um, in diving, di diving illness and, and in arterial gas embolism, I, I would say it's, it's already been proven to work uh, empirically. Another question is, does hyperbaric room have something to go with argon gas embolism during hepatic surgery? Argon gas embolism during hepatic surgery? Not sure I can answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I presume what, what the, the question is, uh, argon, argon being released in, with laser surgery, uh, getting into the vascular system, and yes, of course, it can. It is a gas like carbon dioxide or like an oxygen gas embolism is also known. And air embolism, of course, is the common one. But all these gases respond to hyperbaric oxygen. I think carbon dioxide is the most uh, kind one with the least uh, adverse effects. But I'm pretty sure that argon will respond. I know of a case where, where um, helium um, gas embolism was treated, but I presume, I'm pretty sure argon will respond as well. Another question, um, I think this is more a, a, a statement and I, I agree with this. Is it time for NATSIPS checklist when priming an arterial line? Mark, will you explain to our um, uh, colleagues from abroad that may link in what NATSIPs are? I uh, don't know a, what it is either. Okay. So I wanted to ask, what is a NATSIP checklist? Uh, so <laughs> essentially, they're, they're, uh, they're basically a checklist for procedures, national um, safety uh, checklist for invasive procedures, and you can set them up for anything where, you, where there's a specific risk that you want to mitigate through the use of a checklist. Uh, so, so um, it's it's a bit like a who time out uh, a surgical safety checklist, but for procedures outside the operating theatre. And yes, it would be a, you would imagine it would be a good idea. And the next question I would like to answer uh, this is why is iatrogenic air embolism not on the NHS Eng England never <laughs> event list as it used to be um, when when this was discussed to be changed, um, I was actually in favor of that because in the United States they have a system of, I think they call it purple letters, um, where um, they actually uh, thought that the 
the uh, never event list uh, was a disincentive to, to um, acknowledge that you have an air embolism case. And then you won't be paid and you will be sued. And for air embolism, unlike something like wrong side surgery, it can actually be uh, escaping scrutiny if you don't send your patient early enough for, for imaging. So I thought it might be a good idea if it comes off the, uh, the, the, the never event list. However, the statistics that we have now, I must add that is only for hyperbaric units, has not shown a significant increase at the time. Um, I don't think it has made a big difference. Uh, I think more importantly will be a, uh, a no blame culture, a register that is um, um, in some way rewarded um, if people are completing the register. For example, if you have your trainees and they can add that to their to their portfolio that they are running this um, registry in their hospital. I think something like that will be a, a much better uh, way to get good data than a never event list. Any views, Mark? Uh, no, no, I think you've covered it very well. Peter, may I ask, there was one question from the, from the audience. Louise wrote that the use of Trendelenburg precision um, or, or that, that apparently sometimes trainees have been instructed to insert a central venous catheter in the upright or semi-upright position. What's the rationale for doing this? Um, because I come from, from a training where I was always taught to use the Trendelenburg position to, to insert a catheter. So um, was there at some time a rationale to do it the other way? I'm not aware of that. Uh, occasionally, when patients are finding it very difficult to lie flat in mm. cardiac failure, for example, with ultrasound, and you can see the, the jugular vein is nicely distended, I would uh, let them slightly head up and do it under ultrasound with yep. knowing that there is a high venous pressure. But otherwise, I always let them lie down and head down and feet yep. up occasionally or sometimes just lying flat with feet up rather than head down. But with ultrasound, you can see whether the yeah. vein is completely collapsed or reasonably distended. Good. Are there any more questions or any comments from the panel? Or shall we say thank you and um, apologies for those that logged in late and uh, if there are any other questions or any comments uh, please feel free to contact us um, on the um, intensive care guideline there's a list of telephone numbers of your nearest unit including the unit where Mark and I are involved and Christoph left his email address. Thank you very much and good night everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you.